We'll start again, I think, the next week, because it's, when's Easter? It's, oh, it's in April, so we're good, yeah. Um, <clears throat> okay, so yeah, so we'll continue on with <clears throat> Hebrews uh, after next week. So we've been spending quite a bit of time the last three weeks talking about covenants and the role of covenants in the script, in the biblical story, and um started off with the covenant with Noah and, and creation, covenant with Abraham, and then the covenant with Moses and Israel uh, last week. Um, we didn't talk about the covenant with David, and we will do that at some point, maybe not in this book, but it's not a big part of the book of Hebrews. So uh, so today we're actually, we're going to actually get into <laughs> Hebrews chapter 8 after four Sundays. So... But before we do that, um, last couple of Sundays, I, I had a little note in my uh, outline about um, taking a few minutes for some questions and answer discussion, uh, because we've been covering quite a bit of material and uh, several important theological ideas as we kind of work through this, um, this topic. So um, if there are any comments, questions before we kind of get jumping into this passage anybody has about what we've covered so far I've answered all the questions you have okay that's fine and you can always email me too we got my email up there so uh, or sometimes just interrupt me in the class Okay, so Hebrews chapter 8, I'm going to read verses 1 through 6 first, and then we're going to hit the second section later. Um, now, the main point in what we are saying is this. We have such a high priest, one who is seated at the right hand of the throne of majesty in the heavens. Heavens is plural there. The NIV doesn't translate it plural. Uh, a minister in the sanctuary and a true tent that the Lord and not any mortal has set up. For every high priest is appointed to offer gifts and sacrifices, hence it is necessary for this priest also to have something to offer. Now, if he were on earth, he would not be a priest at all, since there are priests who offer gifts according to the law. They offer worship in a sanctuary that is a sketch in a shadow of the heavenly one. For Moses, when he was about to erect the tent, uh, the tabernacle, was warned, see that you make everything according to the pattern that was shown you on the mountain. But Jesus has now obtained a more excellent ministry, and to that degree he is the mediator of a better covenant, which has been enact enacted through better promises. For if that first covenant had been faultless, there would have been no need to look for a second. I guess I read a little farther. Um, so Jesus is mediator of a new covenant. So now that we have kind of behind us this uh, long discussion and kind of background and foundation in the other covenants, um, it's, it's much easier for us to kind of get a, a good picture of what the new covenant is and how it relates and, and, and doesn't relate to the other covenants. What are the similarities? What are the differences? Um, so in chapter 8, uh, he's moving on from his discussion in chapter 7 about the, the parallels and um, similarities and differences between Jesus and Melchizedek, right? And using Psalm 110, but that analogy with Melchizedek kind of emphasizes certain things, but doesn't discuss other things as far as the priesthood of Jesus. So the Melchizedek analogy emphasizes the kingship, right? Because Melchizedek was a king. Uh, it emphasizes that Jesus is an eternal high priest, just like Melchizedek, who has no father or mother, beginning or end. Um, but that analogy kind of breaks down because it doesn't really say how Christ's priestly ministry relates to the Old Testament sacrificial system. It doesn't relate how it um, 
compares to the, what the priests are doing, right, in the tabernacle or in the temple in the time period that this author is writing. Uh, it doesn't address, you know, what's the problem of, of ongoing human sinfulness. So in this section, in the section, I mean, chapters 8, 9, and 10 in particular, um, the author of Hebrews is going to go into a big uh, compare and contrast between Jesus and uh, especially the Day of Atonement. Okay, so we're going to hit that more next week. We'll talk about the Day of Atonement, uh, the tabernacle traditions, and so on. So, but what, what's happening here is there's this twofold emphasis, right? There's the completed work of Christ. So the author says he sat down at the right hand. And this is, this is also something that was mentioned in chapter one, the exaltation of Jesus. He sat down, kind of a past action. And then secondly, his ongoing mediation on our behalf. He serves in the sanctuary. Okay, so there's a part of Jesus' ministry that is completed, right? And then there's another part that's not completed. He's, he continues to serve. It's a present tense. That word for service in the Greek is liturgos. It's where we get the word liturgy, right? That there's a service of worship that's going on there. And so he's serving in the sanctuary, but what's really interesting is that the writer is now going to use a different kind of compare and contrast between the heavenly sanctuary and the earthly sanctuary. And what's the relationship between those? Um, because in, in the Jewish world, understanding of worship and really this is much broader even in other pagan uh, worship and pagan temples they they saw the worship as kind of a meeting of the gods in 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 the heavens and the god and god and people on earth right it's a meeting of heaven and earth and uh if you if you want to watch a good video on that you can go to bible project uh, has a little video called heaven and earth and how they're interrelated um, I've shown that in class before. So one of the things in order to understand what's going on here and, and why he's using this language is to understand a little bit about how the Israelites saw the world, how they saw the heavens and the relationship of the heavens to the earth. So the earthly tabernacle or temple was a physical manifestation and model of worship patterned after a heavenly ideal. So later in, in chapter 9, he's going to talk about the, the tabernacle that's not made with hands, right? You've got the earthly one that's made with hands. You've got the heavenly one that's not made with hands. So the heavenly tabernacle can also have a sanctuary, can have an altar of sacrifice, have an Ark of the Covenant, Holy of Holies. If you read the book of Revelation where he's caught up into heaven, has these visions, you know, he's, he's, he's basically dis, you know, describing a, a worship center in heaven. Uh, with all of these things that, you know, you have as uh, copies, basically, on the earth. So the author refers to the earthly sanctuary as a copy and a shadow. Now, a shadow may not be the real thing it represents, but it can still reflect something of the shape, size, nearness, etc., of the thing it stands for, right? You see a shadow, <laughs> sometimes you see a menacing shadow, right? Uh, and you go, oh, oh, there's something there, you know. Well, it's just a shadow. Yeah, but there's something <laughs> behind that shadow, right? And, and so this is how he's using that word. And he's, he's still drawing on this interpretive scheme, which uh, we find in the book of Hebrews more than anywhere else in the New Testament, and it's called typology. So earlier we talked in chapter 3 and 4, right, where he's using typology of Sabbath, so in that case, you have like a prototype, which is the Genesis, um, the day of rest that God establishes. Then you have the, set, the rest that the people of Israel have in the promised land, right? And then you anticipate that's kind of a model of the future rest that the people of God are going to have in the kingdom of God. Typically, the typology is just two. It's just type and anti-type, and that's kind of what we have in this. Or, or Melchizedek was another typology. So... So he does this to help his readers understand the contingent and temporary nature of their sacrificial rituals and ceremonies, okay? And, and this is just something that, that was understood by people who were involved in the temple worship. 
Um, I put a quote there from the Book of Wisdom, which reflects that idea. You have given command to build a temple on your holy mountain and an altar in the city of your habitation, Jerusalem, a copy of the holy tent that you prepared from the beginning. So the earthly is seen as a copy, and it's interesting, that word uh, mimema, um, it's where we get this word, which has become quite popular nowadays. Um, what's a meme? A what? Okay. Yeah. So when someone talks about a meme, like on the internet, what is that? Okay. Yeah, and what's happening is, of course, it's being copied, right? And it's being repeated and repeated and repeated and repeated. And that's what the idea uh, behind that word is. Uh, it, typically, today, it's some kind of cultural information which is spread um, through, through the Internet or whatever. Um, so it's a good summary here of, of kind of how this worked in, in the Jewish mind. When the tabernacle and later the temple was built as the earthly place of God's habitation, it was designed according to the pattern. Okay, so this, there's a quote in our passage here, right, from Exodus. Make sure you make it according to the pattern. And our writer in Hebrews is using the Greek translation of the Old Testament. Um, and it's the, the word that's used there, pattern, is the word tupos. So it's where we get the word type, right? Um, designed according to the pattern shown you on the mountain. It was a model of the cosmos as God's dwelling place whose function foreshadowed the atonement of Jesus Christ. As the first century Jewish historian Josephus notes, the tabernacle and everything in it were made in way of imitation and representation of the universe. Okay? They understood the tabernacle and then later the temple was somehow a model of the first couple of chapters of Genesis, the, the creation story, okay? So when you think of the different aspects then and the, the accoutrements and things that are in the temple, they are meant to represent something from the creation story. The, um, the three-part structure represented the sea with the water basin, the land by the bronze pillars of the earth, and heaven by the Ark of the Covenant, God's footstool. With the first two parts generally accessible, but the third part, the place of God's dwelling, restricted only to the high priest. The golden lampstand and the bread of the presence represent light and food provided by God, as in the Genesis story. The massive curtain separated the Holy of Holies from the place of human dwelling. This was the curtain that was torn in two from top to bottom when Jesus died. Hebrews explains that this opened a new and living way for us into the very presence of God. And we're going to we'll talk about that a little bit more next class. Um, I'm going to do a little layout of the tabernacle and the temple and, and talk about how, how this works with the story of Jesus and the death of Jesus, the tearing of the, the curtain and so on. So Jesus' high priestly ministry. So this is something that the author of Hebrews has kind of been um, setting up from the very beginning of the book, right? And he's now getting to kind of the details of it. So he's made various references to Christ's atoning sacrifice, to his high priestly role, uh, especially the exaltation of Christ um, in relation to God the Father. And then, of course, what we're interested in is what are the practical benefits of Christ's priesthood? Um, how does that work for those of us who, who worship him? So I put it just kind of a few of the, the summary statements there. After he had made purification, so notice past tense there, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. So the idea of sitting down there emphasizes the idea of completion, right? I'm done <laughs> with this part of it anyway. Um, the one who sanctifies, so per purification, the one who sanctifies and those who are sanctified all have one father. So that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in the service of God. So there's a present service of God 
to make a sacrifice of atonement for the sins of the people. There we have the past, right? Reconciliation through that sacrifice. We have a high priest who in every respect has been tested as we are, yet without sin. So this goes back to the author's important discussion of Christ's incarnation, right? Permanent incarnation, taking on human flesh, living life, a full human life uh, in that time period and, and be experiencing the same kinds of things we experience in order to identify with us as sinners. Let us then approach the throne of grace boldly. And the throne of grace there might have kind of a reference to the ark, uh, of the covenant. Sometimes the ark is, is described as a throne. And the idea of approaching, the language of approaching, is priestly language, is that you're approaching God with the sacrifice there. You're entering into God's presence in the temple. We have this hope that enters the inner shrine behind the curtain. So now here, and this is back in chapter 6, all right, that whole phrase, enters the inner shrine behind the curtain, is actually from Leviticus 16. It's, it's the whole phrase is taken from a chapter that talks about the Day of Atonement, which we're going to look at more next class. Where Jesus, a forerunner on our behalf, has entered. Finally, Christ holds this priest, his priesthood permanently because he lives forever. Therefore, he is able to save completely those who approach God through him, right, the, through the agency of Christ, since he always lives to intercede for them. So we have a present tense ministry, worship. Such a high priest meets our need, holy, blameless, pure, exalted above the heavens. Again, there's, did you have a question? No? Okay. I'm like an auctioneer. If you move your hand, like to say, So the new covenant in relation to the old. So I want to read a little bit more of our passage, um, actually the rest of chapter eight. God finds fault with them when he says, the days are surely coming, says the Lord, when I will establish a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. Not like the covenant that I made with their ancestors on the day when I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt. For they did not continue in my covenant, and so I had no concern for them, says the Lord. This is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel. After those days, says the Lord, I will put my laws in their minds and write them on their hearts. I will be their God, and they will be my people. They shall not teach one another or say to each other, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me, from the least to the greatest. For I will be merciful toward their iniquities, and I will remember their sins no more. In speaking of a new covenant, he has made the first one obsolete. And what is obsolete and growing old will soon disappear. Now you have to imagine how difficult some of this language might be for a Jewish believer, right? Uh, and that's one of the reasons why what we have here in this long quotation from Jeremiah uh, it's the longest quotation not only in Hebrews, it's the longest quotation in the whole New Testament. Uh, and when writers are quoting a lot, it means <laughs> there's an apologetic going on, right? There's a defense. He needs evidence for this uh, statement that he's going to make. Uh, and what's really interesting is, is this statement in Jeremiah, and we're going to unpack it a little bit more next class, but um, there's so many different things going on in this passage that we're, we can't cover it today. Um, this statement is so unique, the idea of a new covenant, that it's not repeated anywhere else. No other Old Testament writer dares touch this idea. Okay? We, we have all of this literature, Jewish literature, in between the Old Testament and the New Testament. I mean, dozens and dozens of Jewish writings, right? Nobody mentions it. Um, I mean, the only, the only community, Jewish community of that time period that did take that passage on was the Dead Sea Scroll community, the Qumran community. And they, they were sometimes called the Covenanteers, okay? 
because if you know anything about that community, you know, they considered the, the temple um, corrupt. They considered the priesthood corrupt. Um, they were not going to have anything to do with the, the sacrificial system. So they created their perfect little community out in the desert and built buildings. And that's where we get the Dead Sea Scrolls, right? And, uh, and they saw themselves as the new covenant people. But this was where God was working in a special way. Um, but it's interesting because that's, that's the only community or Jewish group that we know of that really took on that passage from Jeremiah. I'll read a little bit about them. The remnant with whom the new covenant was concluded considered themselves the true Israel. Okay, everyone else, you guys are not really Israel. The people who lived in and around Qumran believed firmly that they were part of the remnant raised by God to be a plant of righteousness and truth. They enacted a ceremony of covenant renewal annually uh, at the Festival of Weeks. So every year they would celebrate this, the new covenant that they are living out. Um, but, you know, just imagine now you're, you're one of these Hebrews and, and you're reading this or hearing this for the first time. Um, that the new covenant is going to supplant the old covenant, right? And you're going, wait a minute, you know, that's like 1,300 years of history and, and tradition and rituals that God himself established. You're just going to, yeah, it's over, it's, it's done. Uh, and so, you know, this, this is why he has to argue uh, here at, at length. And then later in chapter 10, he's going to repeat even another section uh, of Jeremiah there, this, this passage that we just read. So it's interesting that if you think about this, when, when this is written, when Jeremiah writes this, we're, we're talking about midway historically, chronologically, uh, between the first covenant with Moses and the coming of Jesus Christ, right? We're talking Jeremiah somewhere around 600 BC, before the exile. And God's already saying, okay, uh, I'm gonna have a new covenant. <laughs> Uh, you know, I'm the one that established the old one, so I can do what I want. Um, and so what does that tell us? It tells us that even God who initiated the old covenant understood that there were limitations to it, right? That it was provisional. And so what are some of the shortcomings? Um, so on the back then, I've got three. Uh, there are others we could talk about, but... Um, the old covenant was conditional. The offer of the covenant to Israel is dependent on the nation's obedience, right? So when you go back to Exodus 19, where God offers the covenant to Moses and Israel, uh, God says, if, if <laughs> you obey my voice and keep my covenant, um, then blah, 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 right? And the people answered as one, everything that the Lord has spoken, we will do. Yes, famous last words. Um, so God says first, okay, do you want to have a relationship with me? And uh, you're going to be a kingdom of priests and you're a holy people. I'm going to pick you out from all the nations. And you guys want that? Yeah, we want that. We'll do everything you say. Okay, so then the very next chapter 20, right, says, okay, well, here are the commandments, <laughs> right? So you got the 10 commandments. And then you have in chapter 20 through 23, it's called the book of the covenant. So you have not just the Ten Commandments, but you have other laws as well. And so after God says that, in chapter 24 of Exodus, they kind of repeat what they said in chapter 19, declares their pledge of obedience. All that the Lord has spoken, we will do. And we will be obedient. <laughs> so what does Moses do? He immediately grabs a sacrificial animal gets the blood from the animal takes half of the blood and sprinkles it on the altar and gets the other half of the blood and gets a piece of hyssop and he sprinkles the blood on the people's like whoa dude <laughs> you know this is radical uh yeah well i want you to remember this day right i want you to remember your your covenant and your promise Shortly after, uh, or shortly before the death of Moses, um, when you have the second generation, right? All the, the first generation dies in the wilderness. And then you have the book of Deuteronomy. So Deuter, anybody know what that means? Deutero, 
It's two, right? It's second, yeah. And namas is the Greek word for law, right? So it's the book of Deuteronomy is the second law, meaning Moses is reiterating this for the new generation, right? That's why you have the, the Ten Commandments mentioned again in chapter five of Deuteronomy. And then he goes on and he says, you have this whole section of, of 27 and 28 where you have these curses and blessings, right? Curses for, for if you disobey, blessings if you do obey. And, uh, and so they're very specific curses and very specific blessings. You should go read them. So when we get to Jeremiah 600 years later, or so, um, the surprising announcement of a new covenant comes after, of course, and we all know that story, the long sad history of Israel's disobedience. What Jeremiah does is he makes specific reference to the blessings and the cursings um, from Deuteronomy. And when you study the Old Testament prophets and, and you read kind of what are, the, what are the things that they were most concerned about, right? It all, goes, it all goes back, of course, mainly to the Ten Commandments, because the Ten Commandments, we often talk about two tables of the commandments. Uh, Luther talked about that. So you have the first table of the commandments, which would relate to the, the relationship between us and God, right? Uh, don't make any idols. Uh, the second table of the commandments relates to our relationship to one another, so vertical and horizontal. And that's where the summary of the love commandments come from, right? Love the Lord your God love your neighbor as yourself. And so the two things that the, the prophets always come back to are one, religious decay within the nation and two, moral decay within the nation. And they're inter interrelated to each other. So Deuteronomy 27 in the curses, uh, cursed be anyone who makes an idol or cast an image, cursed be anyone who deprives, so there's the religious, right, the vertical, then you have the horizontal. Cursed be anyone who deprives the immigrant, the orphan, and the widow. Um, I guess I got the widow in there twice. That's good. Um, the widow of justice. All the people shall say, amen. When we have a song we sing, all the people said amen. Um, so Jeremiah comes back to that. And this is, the prophets often, when you study prophets, the Old Testament prophets, I used to teach Old Testament prophets class. And they're usually not saying anything new. Um, they're just enforcing what, what God had already said previously, particularly in, in, in the Pentateuch. And, uh, and so Jeremiah comes back to this. He says, if you truly act justly with one another, if you do not oppress the immigrant, the orphan, and the widow, and if you do not go after other gods to your own hurt, then I will dwell with you in this place. Okay. Uh, if you read Amos, boy, Amos is, is, is a trip to read because Amos almost never talks about religious decay. His whole book is about moral decay, ethical decay. Uh, why are you guys people taking advantage of your fellow Israelites? <laughs> Secondly, the old covenant was subject to human weakness. Despite Israel's election and privileges, the stubborn human condition of self-centered sinfulness acknowledged by God before and after the flood has not fundamentally changed. Even after God's people have experienced his redemptive power in the Exodus, provision in the wilderness and inheritance in the promised land. So we, we talked about this, I think, when we did the, the covenant with Noah. Um, so after the flood, there's this like resignation that God says, the inclination of the human heart is evil from youth. Okay. It's almost exactly like what he said in chapter six before the flood, right? The inclination of the human heart. Uh, yeah, I'm going to wipe it all clean. We're going to start over. Well, that part didn't start over. Um, we're still sinful. We still need redemption. And this is something that's echoed by Jeremiah. The heart is deceitful above all things and beyond cure. Who can tame it? Now, when we hear that word heart, we, we often associate it with kind of love and affection and emotion and so on. Um, but in biblical understanding, that word can be used in, in a variety of ways. And 
they didn't really have a concept of the brain as kind of the center of, of, of a person's actions. Um, and, and sometimes even the word heart, when it's translated heart, it could be some other organ. It could be liver. Love the Lord your God with all your liver. Um, it could be kidney. Okay, my, Jeremiah earlier in the book uses the word kidney. Now, when you read your NIV or whatever, it'll say heart. But it's, it's, it's the inward part of you, right, is how they understood that. Um, so in biblical understanding, the heart is recognized as the control center for human knowledge and discernment, the seat of the will which stimulates one's actions. So the new covenant does not dispense with the law. Okay, so there's going to be some interesting things here because, you know, what is new and what is not new, right? When you read the new covenant statement, there's some things that are still the same. Uh, and so what, what is and what is not going to be changed. God's going to write his law on our hearts. I will put my Torah, that's what the word is in the Hebrew, within them and I will write it on their hearts. But it's going to be different. It's going to be a divinely empowered inward motivation. It's going to be something where we're responding in gratitude rather than servitude. So you have this pre-exilic promise uh, in Deuteronomy 30. So now note that that's chapter 30, comes right after the curses and the blessings, right? And it actually comes right after Moses predicts the exile and says, you guys are going to go into exile uh, and then God's going to return you. The Lord your God will circumcise your heart and the heart of your descendants so that you will love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul in order that you may live. Then Jer uh, Ezekiel has this post-exilic reminder. I will give them one heart and put a new spirit within them. Okay, we're going to talk about that more next week. And Paul elaborates on this in 2 Corinthians 3 about the relationship of the Holy Spirit to God's commandments. I will remove the heart of stone and give them a heart of flesh so that they may follow my statutes and keep my ordinances and obey them. If you were in the first service, you heard Pastor Jeff talk about this passage, actually. Um, we're going to watch a little video, Bible Project video on the heart, um, just to kind of illustrate some of this. Morning and evening, Jewish people have prayed these well-known words as a way of expressing their devotion to God. They're called the Shema. Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord is one. And as for you, you shall love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, and with all of your strength. We're going to look at the fourth key word in this prayer, heart, which in Hebrew is sometimes pronounced levav, or more often in a shorter form, lev. Now, different cultures throughout history have had different conceptions of how the human body works, and this is also true of the ancient Israelite writers of the Bible. They knew that the heart was an organ in the chest that sustains life. There's mention of a heart attack in the Bible, Naval, whose heart died inside of him and he became like stone. But the biblical authors talk about the heart in many other ways that might seem strange to modern readers, and that's because these Israelites had no concept of the brain or any word for it. They imagined that all of a human's intellectual activity takes place in the heart. For example, you know with your heart in the Bible. Your heart is where you understand and make connections. In the book of Proverbs, wisdom dwells in the heart. And your heart is what you use to discern between truth and error, like Solomon did when he was king. So the heart is where you think and make sense of the world, and it's where you do more. In the Bible, the heart is where you feel emotions. You feel pain in your heart, like Hannah did when she couldn't have any children. In fact, the phrase, a broken heart, comes from ancient biblical Hebrew. You also experience fear in your heart. Your heart can melt or be distressed. Your heart can even be depressed. But then, on the flip side, your heart is where you experience joy. In Hebrew, to be happy is to be good of heart, or to have a heart of joy. So the heart is the generator of physical life. It's also the center of your intellectual and emotional life, and there's more. In biblical Hebrew, the heart is where you make choices motivated by your desires. So David had it in his heart to build a temple for God. Your heart is where your affections are centered. They're called the desires of your heart. And if you really want something and go after it, it's like what Nathan said to David, whatever's in your heart, go and do it. 
So then, in the Bible, the heart is the center of all parts of human existence, as in the well-known proverb, guard your heart because from it flows your whole life. Now, the prophet Jeremiah believed that the human heart was fundamentally broken. He said, the heart of a human is deceitful above all, irreversibly sick, who can even understand it? He had watched a whole generation turn away from God. They started sacrificing their children as if that were a good thing. So this is why in the imagination of the Hebrew prophets, the only hope for humanity is the total renewal of the human heart. Moses predicted that if Israel was ever going to love their God, their heart would need to be circumcised, which is a very vivid and surprising metaphor about removing evil and stubbornness from the human heart. David, after he committed murder and adultery, pleads with God to create in me a pure heart. The prophet Ezekiel hoped for a day when God would remove the heart of stone and give his people a new heart of soft flesh, which is very similar to Jeremiah's hope that God would write the commands of the Torah on the hearts of his people. And that brings us all the way back to the Shema. Every day, God's people are called to devote to God their whole body and mind, their feelings and their desires, their future and their failures. This is what it means to love the Lord your God with all of your heart. That's a good summary of uh, what we've been covering here, um, especially in the connection to Jeremiah. And we're gonna talk about that aspect of it. Um, how does God write his law on our hearts um, the next time we uh, meet together? Okay, the last section then. The old covenant was always intended as preparatory to the new. Um, I was looking over some old notes of mine from Romans and uh, you know, I, I previously kind of had this dichotomy of there's the economy of law and there's the economy of grace. And, and, and reading that now after years of teaching and studying, I'm going, no, 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 you idiot. Um, <laughs> why did you say that? Um, but we all grow and we all learn. And there are some people that, that want to do that, that want to kind of create this, this distinction between the old covenant in that sense and the new covenant. Um, and I think that's really to misunderstand the nature of God and the relationship of God to, to his people and to his creation. Um, even the old covenant was based on God's sovereign election and grace towards his people. Okay, so God saves them, God delivers them in, in the Exodus and then says, do you wanna have a relationship? And it's only after that that he says, okay, here's the laws, right? Um, as Bonhoeffer said, God gives before God commands, okay? And the Apostle Paul acknowledges that the gospel was by faith from first to last. And this is something where he uses the example of Abraham. Um, and I mentioned this last week, it doesn't start out with works and go to faith. It starts out with faith and continues with faith and grace. So does this mean that the first covenant was a failed experiment and that the new covenant is plan B? Okay, interesting to think about that. And God going, all right, well, I tried that and it didn't work, so I guess I'm gonna have to do something different. Um, the implication we get from Jeremiah in the, in the book of Hebrews that we're working through is that the superseding of the old covenant was part of God's design from the beginning. A planned obsolescence rather than an ill-fated divine exercise. Even though the law or the Torah promised life, God knew that ultimately it would not lead to life, whether that involved a single commandment or 513, right? So it didn't matter whether it was just one with Adam and Eve or 513, um, this type of theological tension, and theologians call this an antinomy, uh, is illustrated already in the garden where God commands obedience, all the while knowing that his command will be broken, having his ultimate rescue plan and salvation purposes in place. Okay, um, This idea of antinomy, it's, it's, it's like two rails of, of a train track kind of going, and, and they, they, of course they can't meet, um, but then you've got, you know, like, let's take a different topic. Um, you have the sovereignty of God and you have free will. Hmm, 
How do those work together? Um, well, somewhere in the distance in the future, uh, we'll, we'll see how they work together. But we don't at this point. We have God's sovereignty. We have human free will. There's tension there. Um, so sin entered the world both contrary to the will of God and according to his plan. Think about that. So the argument of Hebrews is not that the old covenant was bad, only that the new covenant is better. And we, we talked about this a few weeks ago and I had these better promises. I mean, he, he uses the word better more than anyone in the New Testament. Uh, better hope, better covenant, better promises, better sacrifices, better country, better resurrection, a better word. Um, you know, none of this was surprising to God, uh, what would happen. And, uh, and so you have these passages that talk about and, and imply that God knew from the beginning, you know, what he was going to do. Matthew 25, come you that are blessed by my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from when? From the foundation of the world. He chose us in Christ before the foundation of the world, right? Nothing is surprising God. Now, I, I do want to mention have time here. Um, on the first point, the old covenant was conditional. Um, the old covenant was conditional and it was bilateral in the sense that there were obligations and promises from both sides of the parties, right? From Israel to God and from God to Israel. Um, but there's something a little bit different on God's part is that God has this quality called what? Chesed. Okay, sometimes it's C-H. Chesed, right? What does that mean? Yeah, New Testament idea would be grace. Loving kindness. Yeah, it's, it's a really, it's a hard word to translate um, because it combines the idea of love and loyalty, right? Um, and so sometimes it's translated covenant loyalty or covenant faithfulness or covenant love. That is never abrogated, okay? The old covenant may pass away, but God's covenant faithfulness does not pass away to his people. And this is something that you see illustrated in the book of Hosea, for example. Uh, but you also see it illustrated in Romans 9 through 11, three chapters where Paul talks a lot about what, what's going to happen to his people and the promises to his people. And at the end of that conversation in, in Romans 11, Paul summarizes by saying the gifts and the calling of God are irrevocable. Okay. And in Jeremiah 31, 3, just before our passage, the new covenant passage, God says, I have loved you with an everlasting love. I have loved you, Israel, with an everlasting love. So even though there are conditions uh, in, even in the old covenant, uh, God keeps his part of the bargain. And this is one of the things that Paul wants to really emphasize in the earlier chapters of the book of Romans, where he uses this word um, righteousness. And it's, a, it's from the Hebrew word tzedakah. And it relates to God's righteousness and to his covenant faithfulness that God can be trusted that God is going to keep his promises, that God is going to get us out of the mess that we've put ourselves into. Um, there's a quote there from N.T. Wright. I'm not going to read it, but I had quoted that in class before, I think from the, the book itself. But I put a little longer quote there and because it really kind of helps encapsulate this idea of, you know, the old covenant was good, but it was limited. And the new covenant is better. And we're going to, we're going to unpack that a little bit more next class. So, all right. Um, remember, next week is daylight savings, right? Yeah. All right. We'll lose an hour. Let's uh, let's close in prayer. Thank you, Father, for your word. We thank you that you are have worked to change our hearts, to come into our hearts through your Spirit, to make us uh, want to love you and obey you to do what is best for us and our families and our friends.
and neighbors. We thank you for that undying covenant love that you have for us and for your world. In Jesus' name, amen. Hey. A present from oh, Gwen. Okay, thank you. <laughs>